Uh, on Thursday afternoon of this week, I was working on my message in the Starbucks at Chapters, and I, I noticed the Father's Day decorations and, well, really promotions for things to sell us, uh, beginning to fill the shelves. As I was thinking about my own dad at this time of the year, I always do, um, even after it's been 10 years since he passed away, he went to be with Jesus, but I was thinking about that one piece that I think almost every child thinks about at least sometime in their life, and it's this, is this question, is dad proud of me? And I ask maybe sometimes myself, you know, would dad be proud of, of me now? Which is in some ways another way of asking, does he love me? And um, I, dads, I suppose this is a reminder for us to make that really clear to our kids, that they know that from us. In our text today, we heard, again actually, a voice, the voice of the Father God speaking these words over his son, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. These are words of love and affirmation, but these words, I mean, though I'm sure they were encouraging to Jesus, they're not really for him. They are mostly for the disciples and for us, for you and me. This is the exact phrase, word for word, that we heard at Jesus' baptism. But of course, there's also this addition this time. A word that the disciples and you and I need to hear. It is this, listen to him. Now there's a lot that we could address in this chapter, but I'm really just going to focus on the first portion that I read, on Jesus' glory and how it's revealed. We're going to dig into the reality of Jesus' identity, but then focus on what it really means to take the words of the Father into our hearts as well. So let's pray as we begin. God, we ask that you would open us to all you want us to hear from you through this text today. Amen. We find that Jesus begins. In this chapter, we read how Matthew tells us that Jesus takes this small group, Peter, James, and John, just the three of them. And, um, and last week I mentioned... He's got these three guys with him. I, I mentioned last week that Jesus is now beginning to make preparations for going to the cross and the resurrection and actually to ascend to the Father. He knows that he's preparing his disciples to take the mission forward. And I want to begin by pointing out why Jesus leads these guys up the mountain. Peter, James, and John, they will play a central role in the beginning of God's new community of Jesus' followers, the church. Now, last week in Matthew 16, we saw that Peter declares, he finally gets it, Jesus is Messiah. And, and that word, Messiah, means king. But also we found out that the disciples were completely confused by the idea that Jesus would have to suffer and die, that that would be a part of his vocation or his calling and his role as king. They had a completely different set of militaristic and political aspirations for Jesus. But Jesus, at the end of the chapter, he talks as though he already has authority to reign over all of history. And he makes this huge promise. Right at the end of 16, he says this, truly I tell you, some who are standing here, and he's speaking to his 12 uh, disciples, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, I, uh, probably five or six years ago now, I, I got a really really long email from a person, doesn't attend our church, but had seen some of my writings in the newspaper and that kind of thing. And, and, and he wrote me and he said, uh, he argued in this long email that Jesus promised to return before the disciples died and that because he didn't, Jesus was wrong and therefore Christianity was a farce. Hmm. Was he right? Is Jesus in this text promising to return before his disciples die, at least some of them? That's not at all what Jesus is doing here. He wasn't talking about his return. He was talking about two events. The resurrection, most certainly, and on the backside, by the way, on the backside of your um, bulletin last week, I didn't deal with this in, in, the, in the text, and so I, I did a little write-up, and I pointed to Daniel chapter 7 and Matthew 28, uh, if you want me to email you that, I can do that. But 
Jesus is talking about two events, the resurrection and this event, this leading these up the mountain at this time. Uh, let me add one more point. Remember, Peter has just named Jesus Messiah. It means anointed one. That's what you did with a king. And a king has a kingdom, a people he leads, and a domain that he rules over. So put to get the two together. Jesus is king, Messiah, and he already reigns as king. After the resurrection, the early Christians had a very basic confession. This is the first thing in terms of like a creed that Christians had. It was this, Kyrios Jesus, two words, Jesus is Lord. Uh, it was a subversive political statement at the time because citizens of the Roman Empire were required to pledge allegiance saying this, Kyrios Caesar. Caesar is Lord. They take the exact same words that were used in the, in, the, in the empire and apply them to Jesus. And essentially they're saying, Jesus is Lord and not Caesar or anyone else. The early church believed that Jesus was already reigning as the king over all of history. No wonder so many of them were killed at the hands of that empire. They called Jesus king. They believed he reigned. Uh, that's a picture called the um, Pantocrator, Christos Pantocrator. It's in uh, Hagia Sophia, which is the huge church in Istanbul. What was, uh, and we got to see this. This is Jesus reigning as king. The early church believed Jesus was king over all. So although the Christians were awaiting the day when Jesus would return, would judge and remove all evil and wickedness, and finally and fully set up the kingdom, with this statement, Jesus is Lord, they were declaring that the kingdom was already present in and through King Jesus, and it would finally and fully come one day. How does Jesus reign, though? Well, he, through the presence of his Holy Spirit, he lives in all of his followers. That's in you. If you, are, if you belong to Jesus, his Holy Spirit is in you. And then through us together as his people, the faithful community of the church. So this all becomes clear to Jesus' followers after his death and resurrection. They'll see him as the ultimate reigning king. But more, in this scene that I just read, Peter, James, and John get a glimpse in advance of Jesus' true glory as king. So yes, some of them really do get to glimpse Jesus' majesty, his coming, reigning uh, king of the kingdom, even before the resurrection. Here's the first big point then. We can, trust, we can trust the Jesus story as recorded here in the New Testament, in the preaching and writing of the first witnesses. No, Jesus wasn't mistaken about his promise to show some of them the kingdom glory. It happens right here. And more, Peter, after seeing uh, Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus, he says, I'll build three shelters, one for each of you. Peter, at this point, sees Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. See, Peter doesn't really get it yet. What happens next shows just how wrong he is. Notice how Matthew writes it. He says this, while he was still speaking... Like Peter hadn't even got the words out of his mouth, this Jesus is equal with Moses and Elijah. These words aren't even out of his mouth. And a bright cloud, and now you have to recognize in the Old Testament, a bright cloud like that uh, represented the very presence of Almighty God. A cloud surrounds them and a voice says, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to whom? Him, Jesus, my son. Now we need to know both Moses and Elijah had significant encounters with God on a mountain. You just get to see some parallels here. Both were key figures in Israel's history. Moses and Elijah came to represent the law and the prophets. When you spoke of Moses and Elijah, it was a shorthand way of speaking of the Old Testament. These two put together represent how God has been revealing himself through ages past. But what do we see here? 
when the disciples heard this, they fell down, face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. No one except Jesus. This encounter was for their benefit. It was to reveal Jesus' status as the glorious reigning king. Before this event, they might have thought that Jesus was, had a significant role, that he was a special guy, that he was even on par with Moses and Elijah, but the voice of Father God says something else. This is my son. Listen to him. Now, Moses had the joy of bringing the law down the mountain to God's people, Israel. But now, the one that Moses was recording these words from, the one Moses was pointing to is actually standing there in his presence. Listen to what Jesus says to two of the disciples at the end of Luke's gospel. He says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. No one except Jesus. Jesus says he is both the goal and the climax of the story of God recorded in the scriptures. Jesus is the authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament. That's what we get from Matthew 5 to 7, especially. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, that he came to fulfill the scriptures, or to put it another way, he fills full all that the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, were saying and and doing. So Moses and Elijah are delighted, they're full of joy, they're agreeing, saying, yes, this is the one to whom we were pointing all along, the one we were preparing you to meet Make way for Jesus. He's the one who can save us. So when Jesus' face is shining like the sun and his clothes become as the light, these three, Peter, James, and John, are being shown a glimpse of what has been true for all of eternity. Jesus isn't just another great guy or even a great prophet. He is the eternal son of God who will reign for all of eternity, who is worthy of our worship and our obedience. This is how Peter himself speaks about the event in 2 Peter chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him, from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love with him. I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Why does Peter record this event in this way? It's to ensure his readers that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he's the reigning king, that they can trust it. And so can you and so can I. They got to see Jesus unveiled His eternal glory, which had been hidden when he took on human flesh, they got a glimpse of what was behind all of that. And they shouldn't try for a moment to reduce him down to just another human, and neither should we. Peter, in his own reflection on this event, he wants us to know that this story can be trusted. He and many of the other disciples also witnessed Jesus' life and death and resurrection, they went on to proclaim the realities that we read in the Gospel of Matthew, and most of them lost their lives to tell us this story. Here's the second thing we need to see. First was that we can trust the story. Second, quite understandably, these three disciples bury their face in the ground in terror when they hear this voice from heaven. I would too. But after they hear the voice, Jesus comes to them these trembling disciples, fearful, and he, it says that he touches them. Isn't that beautiful? There's just this moment where Jesus in his humanity, in his fleshness, touches them. And they know again the Jesus that they've been following. This is a grace. 
that reminds them that in all of the awe and splendor and majesty, he is also their personal and very much still physically present leader. They needed that. And then he speaks to them with equal kindness. He says, don't be afraid and get up. Like, I got work for you to do. To hear that voice and to know that you're in the presence of the almighty, the holy God, who of us sinful humans, who could bear that? Isaiah, he's given this vision from heaven in chapter six. And when he's given the vision, he's seeing the, just the glory of God filling the temple. He says, woe to me, I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For Woe to me. That's the response of those who come into the presence of Almighty God. We become to see just how in need of forgiveness we are. And for Jesus' Jewish readers, Matthew's, Matthew's gospel as they're reading it, they would instantly hear resonances with the story of Moses who goes up on the mountain and, in the book of Exodus and he has this bold request. He says to God, show me your glory. Wow. What's the Lord's response? He says this, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, but you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord says, there, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. Here's what we need to notice. Jesus has just revealed himself to these disciples. Brilliant light, shining in glory. They get just the smallest glimpse of whom they are really dealing with here. And this voice declares that Jesus really and truly is God's unique son. So even if the disciples don't recognize the full divinity of Jesus at this moment, and they really don't, they'll get that after the resurrection. After the resurrection, they fall down and worship Jesus as God. They are finally able to see clearly all these signs that Jesus has been pointing them to about his identity, who he really is. They will finally see, as us, as the readers of this gospel, heard from the beginning that Jesus really is God with us. And this is what's so key in that moment when Jesus touches his disciples and says, don't be afraid. See, God said to Moses, I will put a cleft in the rock and I'll cover you with my hand. Why? Because the holiness of God would be unbearable for those of us who are sinful, who's, who have been separated from God because of our self-centeredness, because we've set ourselves up in rebellion against God. It would be unbearable unless God were to do something to fundamentally change us to make us the kind of people who could be in his presence. Here's what we need to see. Jesus is both equally God and he is fully human at the same time. But like Moses being hidden in the cleft of the rock, enabling Moses to be in the glorious presence of God and not be destroyed, Jesus becomes that cleft for the disciples and for us. Jesus says, just in a few chapters from here, that he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's 2028. 20, and the final supper, before he goes to the cross, he tells his disciples that his death has a specific function. He says this, it is for the forgiveness of sins. So now they, and you, and I, can hear the words, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be in the presence of Almighty God. Why? Jesus will cover you. The whole mission of Jesus has been to restore and renew the broken relationship that we had with God. To bring about the glory that God always intended for his creation. To remove sin and evil so that we could be in God's very present. And Jesus' death in our behalf makes that possible for us to come before the living God without fear. Jesus is, as we saw, the glorious, majestic, eternal Son of God. We get a glimpse of him in his eternal glory, but then we also glimpse 
his tenderness and love and compassion. He is truly God with us. Absolute in glory and holiness and splendor and tender and comforting, saying, don't be afraid. So there's something key in this for us today. Some of you might be re- tempted to reduce Jesus down to size, like Peter. I'll build you a shelter along with Moses and Elijah, kind of to bring him down to a level where we could sort of listen to Jesus making suggestions on our life, where we can kind of pick and choose what we want to do with what he says. Um, this text should fix that. But for others of you, you might have maybe something like the opposite issue. We might see Jesus as the reigning king, the glorious son of God, but feel terrified to be near him. We might miss the tenderness and compassion and closeness that he demonstrates to his disciples here. We have to see Jesus is both holy God and the cleft that protects at the same time. And now through Jesus' death in our place, he can say to us and we can hear, don't be afraid. Because of my sacrifice for you, you can actually live in the presence of Almighty God. That hymn that we sang today, Rock of Ages, it says it so beautifully. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. And that has two meanings. Both he is the cleft and his life was broken. Cleft, opened up for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. What does that mean for us? First and most important, if you haven't come to place your trust, if you don't know Jesus as your rock, your place of rest and security, of hope that you can actually be accepted by God, why not come home today? Why not put your trust there today to say, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Jesus invites you to come to that place, to know him personally today. How? Well, like in Isaiah 6, when we come to to, to the holy splendor of God and we get to know who he really is, we will say, woe to me, I'm ruined. I've said that because it's true. Woe to me, I'm ruined in the presence of Almighty God. And yet that's not the end for Isaiah. We find that God comes and touches his lips with a coal and he purifies him. He says, look, you're, you're clean now. Only God can do that for you. And he has done it finally and fully through his son Jesus, his death in your place and his resurrection. Put your trust there. I urge you, put your trust there if you haven't yet. You can hear the words of Jesus when he says, get up. Get up from your old life where sin and, and self were at the center. Get up and don't be afraid. That's the last piece. Those who are forgiven and saved, we are new creations. We're now in a relationship with the living God and empowered to follow our loving leader, Jesus. For others of you, you maybe know Jesus, but in your mind and in your practice, he's become reduced to someone who makes suggestions. You're not living in the fullness of his love, and he is inviting you to come back to that place today. Don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of life. Don't be afraid of the unknown because when we come to Jesus, we walk with the one who holds our future. Life eternal in his hands. And get up. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation and God has work for you to do. You are called to be on mission with him. Here's the last big take home that we need for this morning. The father says to these followers and to us today, Listen to him. Jesus, one and the same as the living God, has ultimate authority. Um, Every now and again, I have to say something like this to my kids. You need to listen to your mom and dad. And, And I don't think I'm the only parent in the room who ever has to say that kind of thing or make that point clear again. Um, but I don't just mean you need to hear us, though that's certainly the first step. When I say listen, I mean, do it. Uh, When God the Father says, listen, he means the same. It begs the question of us, are we listening? 
it would be the easiest thing in the world for me to make this point. You need to go home and read your Bible more. If you're not reading your Bible, you need to read your Bible more. Guess what? Maybe some of you need to hear that today. But my point is bigger and better than that. Yeah, maybe some of you are out of the habit and you do need to dust it off. And it needs to become a regular rhythm in a part of your life just to be listening to what God has said. I mean, we're, we're given the scriptures not to ignore them, but to listen. But if you're here on a Sunday morning, my sense is, yeah, you're wanting to listen to the living God. So yes, I can encourage you to open your Bible and read it. That is, you might say, the first step. But I, I want to say something bigger and better than that. Um, there is a difference, you see, between reading my Bible and enacting it, uh, practicing it relating to God with all of the implications of what Jesus and the rest of the scriptures as interpreted through the lens of Jesus is teaching me about relationships, about sex, about forgiveness, about grace, about generosity, about loving our enemy, about hospitality towards strangers or those in need, about the value of all life. Listen, see, means more than just hearing. It is enacting. It's embodying what I've been told and what I now know. To listen to Jesus does require us to be familiar with what he said and the example he sets. Absolutely. And that will only come by paying attention to the Bible and what it teaches in community. That's why we make such a big deal of reading and teaching from the Bible on a Sunday morning. We need to pay attention in community. But it also means a readiness in my heart to say, God, I'm not only going to hear, but I'm ready to enact whatever you're calling me to. Whatever your life, the, the patterns of thinking and feeling and acting, whatever you're directing, I'm doing. That's going to be my way of life. And that's what we pray. When we pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me paraphrase this just a little bit. That's to say, I bring my life to you. And your ways, I pray that in us, your people, that you would bring to life your ways in me, in us. Let every other commitment, every thought, every potential action be subject to your teaching and your ways. Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. We actually pray it against ourselves to some extent. One biblical scholar, he says it like this, if Jesus is truly the son of God, which the events of this transfiguration declare him to be, then it demands that we view everything through his ordering of the world. That's kingdom come. Jesus' ordering of the world. This means that we learn to read every situation, every one of our own impulses and thoughts and desires through the lens of this. How is King Jesus leading me to think, feel, and act and speak about this? It means that every other allegiance I have falls underneath this allegiance our commitment to Jesus and his ways. And that will challenge all other allegiances. See, if, it, if listening to Jesus doesn't challenge you to change your mind or call into question your other allegiances, then I'm afraid to tell you that you're not following Jesus. You're following uh, something you've made up. Because if you get close to Jesus, he will challenge you. He will change you. You will have attitudes and thoughts and actions that are untrue and he will reveal that. And then you'll have a choice. Do I do it or not do it? If you get in contact with the living God, it will be a challenge. It really will. To take Jesus at his word on every issue, that's what we're being called to here. From the seemingly most mundane to the most significant of global issues, the big point simply is this. To whom am I looking for my perspectives, my attitudes, my approaches to each issue in life? Am I listening? Am I paying attention to what's clearly put down in the scriptures and what Jesus is saying? Am I committed to walking it out? Like who is shaping my vision of life and what it's for? Our ultimate goals and directions. Is it Jesus who is setting my priorities? Man, those are questions I have to wrestle with daily. And as a follower of Jesus, I have to make a decision daily to say yes to that. If you're a Christian, you do as well. If you're listening to all that Jesus teaches, uh, both 
what he teaches us to do in terms of ethical practice, but also what he teaches us about God and spiritual reality. Now, the worship team is going to come up here in a moment, and we're going to sing one more song. Uh, but even as they come, I just want to give you a little bit of a what does this look like. You might say, yeah, listen to him. I want to do that, but what does that look like? It looks like a man I recently met who when he came to see his life in the key of self, he saw it as really a dead-end street and began to search out who God is. And he was humble enough to listen to what Jesus said about love, about Jesus' love for him, and about the reality of sin and judgment, about repentance and faith and forgiveness and new life. And the listening is not only for him to gain new information, but he was open to the Holy Spirit's leading in him, and he came to throw himself into this new reality just recently. That's one picture of listening. It looks like a couple I met in Burlington, Ontario. They had come to put their faith in Jesus through the Alpha program. Um, they had come just from the community. They had two little kids. They were a lovely little family. Um, but as they put their trust in Jesus, and as they were listening to what was being what the scriptures said and taught, they said, we're not married, and yet we're functioning as though we are and as though we always have been. And they made the costly decision where he said to his wife, wife, his common-law partner, will you marry me? And then he moved out of the house until their wedding day. They decided at great cost to themselves to let Jesus be their loving leader. You might say, well, you don't really need to do that. I mean, God understands. And they said, no. Yeah, God understands that we need to live under his gracious rule. And we're not married, so we're going to get married. And we're not going to live as husband and wife until we are. It looks like volunteers, all of you who are going to sign up, because our neighborhood and our kids need to know the good news of Jesus and need to know that there's a community who loves them. And so as you're signing up for VBS, you're letting the goodness of God be known to our community. It's the man or woman who makes the decision to just come clean about and receive help and support for their addictions because they want to live free with Jesus. It's the young family who decides that love doesn't decrease but actually increases when you open your home to foster kids or to adopt some others. It's the person who comes to see Jesus spending most of his time seeking out people that most other people in our world are trying to avoid really hard. So she commits herself to a life of hospitality, to seeking out and caring for and paying attention to people who are often in the margins. The question is, what about you? What's the issue or area in your life in particular where you need to listen to pay particular attention to what Jesus is saying to you. What is that issue? Maybe there's an area of your life you've been trying to shut them out of. Now, by the presence of the Holy Spirit in you, if you're a Jesus follower, it's the Holy Spirit who enables you to actually say yes and do it. My question to you is this. Will you be open to the power and leading of the Holy Spirit as you listen to Jesus' voice? Would you say yes to him? Let's stand and close with a song.